Hello, everyone. Hope everyone can hear me. If you can hear me, wave. Plus, it's just nice to see all you waving to me. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here. I see that my name there says the National Stuttering Association. That is not my name. <coughs> my name is Mara Ormond. I'm going to be conducting this webinar today. I'm super excited and so excited that you're all here with me now. Um, so I'm going to start out just sharing a little bit about myself. My, uh, my work is as a leadership coach. So I work with professionals in the workplace um, to help them overcome challenges and obstacles. They're often inner ones to help them achieve their goals and to work through challenges. I'm also a yoga teacher. And I really see those two aspects of my livelihood um, working in tandem. They're really kind of the same thing. They're, they're both helping people to become aware and to therefore become more able to manage themselves and to reach their goals. So that in a nutshell um, is what I do with both of those um, streams of my livelihood. So I'm going to be talking a lot about mindfulness today. Okay, so let's talk about what we're going to do today. So let's talk about our objectives. So my intentions through this um, webinar is that you will understand what mindfulness is, how it works and why it matters, and especially why it matters to we people who stutter and um, how it can help us with the effects of stuttering and to learn and apply some actual mindfulness pr practices. And lastly, as always, to remind all of us that we're not alone as people who stutter. So we can see just because of all of us are here together that none of us is alone. We're all here together because we stutter or we know someone who does, we love someone who does. And so um, none of us is alone. So the first thing, well, or I guess the next thing that we're going to do is I'm going to ask you to share. Okay, we're going to be talking about the importance of mindfulness to address the challenges of people who stutter in the workplace. So let's first talk about what those challenges are. So if I could ask you to hit that chat button and enter some answers to your experiences about what emotions you experience, what thoughts you have, what typical body responses you have. You don't have to answer all three, just any or all. So emotions, thoughts, and body reaction. I'm gonna stop the share right now because I found that I can't access the chat while I'm in screen share. And I wanna see what people are mm -hmm. responding. Anger muscle tightness, annoyance, sweat, anybody else? Nervous, dry mouth, embarrassed, anxiety. I think a lot of us can relate to these, I know I can. Really tense, anxiety, nervous, frustration, fear, anger, muscle tightness. So there's a lot of universality about these experiences, huh? A lot of us are really um, experiencing the same thing, shame, embarrassed, facial tightness, self-pity, a lot of these things I think we can all relate to. And so they are things that we experience at work, okay? Work is where we spend a lot of our time. One might even say most of our time, and it's where, you know, a lot of our um, performance, a lot of our behavior has a lot more pressure because people are depending on us and we have you know, particular reputations that we would like to maintain or cre create. So these are difficult experiences. 
and uh, I'm going to share my screen again. I'm going to be going back and forth between screen sharing. And so we talked about all of these difficult experiences, okay? And the good news is mindfulness can help. So mindfulness can help with any and all of those things that you just shared and that we all experience, okay? So that's really good news, but you might be asking, but wait, what is exactly mindfulness? What exactly is it? How, to, how, how is it practiced? We hear a lot in the news, corporations, the military, schools, police forces, people with life-threatening illnesses, all these people are practicing mindfulness, but what are they actually doing? And that's what we're gonna talk about today. So, um, okay. So there are a lot of definitions of mindfulness. Okay, what's it all about? The reason some of us don't know exactly what mindfulness is, is because there's no one or two or 10 definitions that are official. There are lots of different ideas, lots of different models and practices and schools and teachers, and they all teach mindfulness, but, but it's a very large umbrella that has a lot of diversity within it. But if you, I'm hearing a little distress, I'm hearing some background noise there. If, if whoever, if everyone could check again, make sure that their uh, microphones are muted. That would be really helpful. But, but anyway, I was just about to share exactly what mindfulness is. So I won't keep you in suspense any longer. Um, mindfulness at its heart, regardless of what school or book or whatever, you know, wherever you're learning it, mindfulness is about redirecting our attention, okay? Redirecting our attention to something else. At its heart, that's what mindfulness is. Okay, and there again, there's a lot of diversity in the mindfulness field, but I'm going to focus for today, I'm going to focus on two different ways of practicing mindfulness. And again, both of these categories are very large. I'm hearing a lot of music. Can someone, I think, um, I don't really know who it is, but I'm hearing a lot of music and it's very distracting. A lot of noise. If someone could, is, um, let me see who these, there's someone named Michelle who's not, who's, I don't know if she's the only one. But I will, uh, we'll muddle through, we'll, we'll figure it out. So the two different ways of redirecting our attention, and again, these are both big umbrellas with a lot of diversity within them. But the first is meditation, okay? okay. So meditation is going away from our daily lives from our daily experiences we're going away from that okay we're getting still we're getting quiet we're turning our attention to any number of things our breath a candle flame our bodily sensations a lot of meditations in, involve body scanning and um, or a word or a mantra so meditation is directing our attention away from our daily lives, away from the experiences of everyday life, okay? And the thing that I think is really important for you to know is that all kinds of meditation are mindfulness, okay? We'll hear about, I mean, we read about sometimes mindfulness meditation, and what I wanna tell you is that all meditation is mindfulness. There's not a kind of mindfulness meditation that is somehow more mindfulness than other kinds of meditation. It's just not, not true. So the other way that we practice redirecting our attention is by observation, okay? And this is where instead of going away from our everyday experience, like we do with meditation, we stay in it. We stay in the experience and we observe and notice our thoughts, our feelings, other things that, we're, that we can notice. We notice them 
in a different way. And so it allows us to experience and handle them differently. Okay, so one is we go away from our everyday experience and the other is we stay in it. Okay, so we're gonna go more into each of these. Um, first, I'd like to just show you a, let's see, show you a, a picture. Okay, this is a gr gr grown up and a little girl. Okay, the grown up's mind is filled with chaotic things, stressful things, anxiety producing things, people wanting a piece of him or her, things to do, things that are stressful, paperwork needing to be done, blah, 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 all the stuff that's filling his or her brain. Look at what's in the little girl's mind, okay? The grown up, the flowers and the sun are not even in his mind, yeah? Not even in there. But the little girl, she's looking at the flowers and the sun and that's all that's in her mind, okay? She is mindful. He's still in a state of chaotic mind. So that's a really good depiction. So now we're going to do another mindfulness practice, okay? And what we're gonna do, I'd like you to just look around wherever you are, your desk or a table nearby, wherever you are and pick up something, some kind of item that you can pick up with your hand. It's small enough for you to pick up. Okay, I'm gonna stop the screen share now. Okay, and uh, okay. So, um, sorry, just getting this view the way I want it. Okay, so what we are gonna do is look at this item for a minute, for a full minute, okay? So right here, I have a pen. I don't know what you've chosen, something on your desk, okay? And we're going to look at that item for a full minute, okay? I'm gonna set my timer, because I guarantee you're going to think that I've lost track of time and it's been more than a minute. Um, so I'm gonna set a timer and we're gonna look, okay, just look. Look at every surface, every little millimeter of the surface. Look at the colors you see. Move it around to different angles. Experience it from different angles. Notice things about it that you never noticed before. And if you feel like you've noticed everything there is to notice about this item, look at it again, notice them again. Keep looking, keep looking, almost there. Okay. That's a minute. You can put down your item. That is a very popular, very common mindfulness practice, except people usually do that with a raisin and they do it for 10 minutes. So imagine that, a raisin for 10 minutes. And the reason that we do this, the point of this exercise is to bring ourselves out of the chaos that is our minds and also to hone our control of our attention, okay? I bet none of us stayed focused entirely on that object for the entire minute. I'm sure we all experienced um, confusion or boredom or impatience. We might have had thoughts intrude about things that are going on in our day, okay? That's absolutely normal. That's not bad. That's normal that that happens. That shouldn't discourage you from thinking that you can be mindful. So it's about managing and ultimately becoming a little better at directing our attention. So we're not looking to eliminate all those things just to minimize them. Okay, so I'm gonna share the screen again and we're gonna go back to those two things that we talked about, which are the meditation and the observation. And we're gonna do the observation first. 
because there's a little more meat there. There's a little bit more to say about that. So I'm gonna do that first, okay? And what are we observing anyway? Okay, we're observing our thoughts, our emotions, our body, our breath, our environment. We'll say more about all of this. We'll dive um, further into all of this. The goal is to whatever you're doing, to give it your full attention, okay? So there's, there's mindful anything. There's mindful eating. There's mindful teeth brushing. There's mindful parenting. There's mindful anything that you do, you can be mindful with it. And this is, you know, we're going to talk about, or I'm going to talk about how that's done. Um, so, th so the first two we're going to talk about, the first two are a little different from the last three. And the reason is we often are not aware of our thoughts and our emotions because we're consumed by them, because we are at the mercy of them. We're enveloped in them. We, we can't see them because we are enveloped by them, we're immersed in them. We feel like it defines us, it colors everything about our experiences. So our thoughts might be things like, I can't do this. I'm such a loser because I'm afraid. Or I can't believe I just said that, I'm such an idiot. Or I didn't speak up, I'm such a coward. Okay, those aren't random things. Those are things that I find myself thinking. Those are from my repertoire of unhelpful thoughts. And what, what we do are we simply notice that we're having these thoughts, okay? And merely by noticing them, we create some distance between us and the thought. So when we notice it, we have to sort of remove ourselves from it even slightly in order to even notice it. So by noticing it, we create some separation between the thought and us. And the more mindful we can become and be aware of our thoughts, the more spaciousness we'll have around our thoughts, the more sort of bandwidth within our minds and our experiences we'll have to even notice these other things lower on the list. Okay, so we get so consumed with our thoughts that we don't even notice these other experiences that we're having. So that's why just naming them is really helpful okay and now we'll talk about emotions okay i'm afraid or i'm terrified or i'm so ashamed about whatever just happened or i'm so embarrassed about that stupid thing i just said because i was trying so hard not to stutter that i ended up saying something really stupid okay again these are my experiences and naming these emotions normalizes them Okay, instead of us being that emotion, we can experience that we're just having that emotion. I'm afraid, I'm nervous, whatever. It detaches, just like with the thoughts, it detaches us from the emotion, okay? And, but most of us, emotions are tough because most of us don't really know what we're feeling, what emotions we're feeling. It can be kind of hard for us to know, okay? And that's why I have this right here. It's called an emotion wheel. And there are a lot of versions of this. I'm not gonna say that this is the right one. It's just the one that I chose to use today. And primary emotions, anger, sadness, surprise, joy, love, and fear. Okay, and all the other emotions that we can have fall within those larger categories. And when we're noticing our emotions, it's important that we name one of these emotions. Okay, often I'll hear people say, well, I feel that she just doesn't understand me. Okay. That's not an emotion, that's not a feeling, that's an incorrect use of the word feel. Okay, that's an opinion or a belief. Okay, if we say I feel, if we're talking about emotions and I say I feel, it's gonna be one of these things. I feel helpless, I feel sad, I feel um, frustrated, I feel delighted. I feel it has to be one of these. Now, I'm not saying that every single emotion that exists is on this wheel, but I think you know what I mean. It has to be an actual emotion. 
And that's why us becoming more and more familiar with the language of emotions allows us to name it more easily and then allows us to feel some separation from it. Um, and another um, um, way of looking at emotions that I really, really like is Tara Brock, who is the leader of the Insight Meditation Society, which is an amazing um, organization, talks about emotions as being universal, okay? Emotions are universal. They're not ours. They're universal. They're just out there, right? So we go to them, okay? I'm in the sadness. I'm in the fear right now. I'm in the shame. Okay, it's not me. I'm just in it. And with that is the implication that I'm not always going to be in it, that I'm going to be able to be out of that at some point. It's a temporary experience. So that's some thoughts about emotion. Okay, and these next three, like I said, are a little different. These are things about our experiences that we don't notice because we're so consumed by the first two that we often don't even notice these. So with our bodies, uh, we can say my heart is pounding, my shoulders are hunched, my shoulders are tight, my face is bright red. These are things that happen to me when I get scared or angry or whatever. But how often can we walk around feeling these things without even being really aware of it because we're so consumed by our thoughts, our emotions? And noticing it, redirecting our attention to it, helps us be able to address it and relieve it. And the same with our breath. I know I can walk around sometimes with really shallow breathing and I don't even realize it. Um, I, I don't even realize that I'm walking around like that and so I'm not, I don't really have the ability or the opportunity to do something about it, to adjust my breathing, et cetera. Um, and the environment, okay, we've already done two mindfulness practices about the environment, okay? We've taken ourselves out of the chaos, which is our minds, and we've redirected it to something in our, in our environment, a pen or what we can notice, see and hear and feel and touch and smell about the um, environment around us, okay? So doing that like we did, again, it takes us out from being consumed by our thoughts and our emotions. So those are some thoughts, some ideas about observing what's there. Remember we talked about staying in the experience. And there's another aspect to observing that I'd like to talk about. It's kind of implied here, but I wanna be really explicit about it. And that is letting it be, okay? We stay in it. The companion to redirecting our awareness is to let it be and acknowledge it and not try to change it, not try to talk ourselves out of that negative thinking, not trying to bounce into something more pleasant because it's more comfortable. Okay, we just let it be. Um, Eastern spiritual traditions would call this non-attachment. But for our purposes today, we're just going to call it letting it be, okay? We don't try to push it away. We employ what a c c c c client of mine named the benign observer. I always loved that, okay? So we're observing our experiences with no value judgment whatsoever. It's like we're some kind of an alien who has no idea how things are supposed to be, an, al an objective alien taking field notes on our inner experiences. Subject is feeling ashamed right now. Subject is thinking that she is an idiot. <laughs> um, and just noticing them, 
just naming them and letting them be. And when we name them, when we bring them out into the light, they lose their edge, they lose their juice, and we're not able to so strongly identify with them. We're not at the mercy of them anymore. So observing and letting them be are two things that go hand in hand. And they're the first part of redirecting our attention that I told you about that, that I'm gonna talk about today. Um, so, oh, but before we do that, right, I wanna talk about why this is important for people who stutter. Why, why does it matter? Why are we even talking about this? Okay, and remember back to the beginning of this webinar when you all were sharing your experiences, your difficult, painful experiences of stuttering in the workplace. Okay, and I know I have them as well. I get terrified sometimes when I have to make a phone call. I get ashamed if I don't make the phone call, so I can't win, right? Same with, you know, I get anxiety about, um, about having to go to a meeting and then I beat myself up if I don't say anything. So, so it's just a constant, um, a constant barrage of negative emotions. I mean, we really get knocked around, don't we? It feels, it feels to me like we're tumbling and flailing and grabbing for some kind of handrail that ends up not being there. That's how it feels to me. I'm tumbling. And, and so naming and becoming a, more aware of our experiences can ground us. It can make us um, stronger and more able to manage those emotions, okay? Plus, people who stutter, I know it's true for me, spend a lot of our time in the past feeling embarrassed or ashamed about things that have already happened, right? Or in the future, feeling afraid of something that's about to happen or that might happen. So being mindful brings us back to the middle, back to the present experience. So we actually stay with what's happening now. Okay, so it helps us not give those thoughts and emotions and other experiences any more energy than they need. So, um, yeah. So, well, there's, there's one thing that I, I also would like to share about, about observing and, and letting it be. John Kabat-Zinn is a guy, an amazing guy, who is con, con, considered by many to be the father of mindfulness in our society. And he, he recommends that we think of our attention as a muscle. Okay, back to when we were looking at the object and we were being distracted by thoughts, um, that we think of our attention as a muscle that needs to be strengthened. And so at first, like I was saying before, at first we can't really do it very well. We're constantly being bombarded by what's called involuntary distractions, thoughts that just pop into our heads unbidden. And the thing that's important to note is that that's not a bad thing. That shouldn't discourage us. It shouldn't uh, make us feel like, oh, well, I'm not really cut out for mindfulness because I can't do it. Um, that's not at all true, okay? These involuntary um, dis distractions are normal. And as we keep building a practice, make that muscle of attention stronger, then we can manage them and experience them more effectively. So I would like to pause at this moment. I've just given a lot of information. And so I would like to pause for a moment and see if anybody has any questions or comments about any of the, um, any of the information that I just shared. And I know that I made a big deal about staying muted, but now if you have anything that you'd like to ask or share, I'd like to invite you to unmute yourself by hitting that little icon in the lower left-hand corner and jumping in and asking a question or making a comment. 
There is no icon in the left-hand corner. <clears throat> Down in the lower left-hand corner, there's not, um, there's not a little icon of a, well. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. Actually, I'm hearing you talk. <laughs> okay. So that yeah. means that you're unmuted. No, so no, to, um, that's really good if you wanted to share or ask something. You can uh, I'm, I went to Holland's Communications Research Institute. And uh, I have a radio show every week uh, on public service radio. <clears throat> had a very, <clears throat> very difficult time this morning. I got a hold of this, uh, a speech therapist in Holland. And, um, you know, the focus when you're, you're doing a show or you, you're talking to a client, speaking, the focus is on what you're saying more than speech fluency. And I had a problem this morning on the air. And um, she reminded me that slow, comfortable, full breath before you speak. Must, slow, comfortable, full breath, and focus on amplitude contour. There are two things at Holland, stretch syllable and amplitude contour. But I missed them both because um, the focus was on the show, was on what I was saying on the show. And that's, that's, a, that's a challenge for stutterers, forgetting what you've learned in, uh, in fluency training. Yeah, well, I think that's, again, that's an experience that we've all had. And um, I, think, I think just one thing that I would share about that, one suggestion that may be helpful, is to not expect yourself initially to be able to do that in such a high pressure situation. That maybe to start practicing, like John K. Cabot Zinn um, says to as as we're beginning to strengthen that muscle of attention, um, you know, if it's if it's not that strong yet when we're first starting out, maybe start practicing that in very low pressure situations um, where we're not so sort of hijacked by the need to be focusing on the content. So that's one suggestion, I mean, that, that seems like a very um, pressure-filled situation that you're talking about if you have a radio show. Um, so that's one suggestion, maybe to lead up to that by starting to practice this in less stressful situations. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh -huh, you're welcome. Okay. Pam has her hand up. Yeah, Mara, I'm looking at the chat box and uh, there are some very good com com comments over here, but um, somebody is asking if you could give an exam exam example how to use some of these mindful tech techniques when you're actually stut stuttering at work and feeling all that stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, um while we're stuttering at work, I mean, there's so many um, stressful situations. I mean, again, you know, just like the previous gentleman shared, I mean, the, the, the idea, I think, the most effective idea is to start with situations that are not really that heightened for us so that we can go gradually be more accustomed and more able. So not to try to go from zero to 60 with all of this. Um, but an example, um, I'd say making a phone call. Um, I place my hand on the receiver. I, you know, this is actually, I don't even know if people have receivers <laughs> anymore. We tend to use our, our smartphones, but, but let's imagine that we're in an office that, that has a receiver, our hands on it, or we're starting to dial. And I can feel my heart start to pound. I can feel my hands start to get sweaty. I can feel myself thinking, oh God, I hope they're not there. God, I hope I get their voicemail. You know, the, these are things that I can notice myself thinking, okay? And instead of becoming consumed with like terror, which I ha have happened to me many times about whether they're going to pick up or not, you know, I can just say, okay, I'm feeling really afraid right now and I'm hoping that they don't answer and I'm just aware of those things. An important thing to talk about 
is that mindfulness doesn't make these experiences go away. Mindfulness doesn't make the emotions, the fear, the thoughts, it doesn't make them go away. It just makes us more aware of them and more able to manage them. So the point of mindfulness is not to never feel afraid again or never feel ashamed again. The point is to be able to say when my hand's on that receiver, oh God, I'm nervous. And it normalizes it. You know, nervousness is something that everybody experiences from time to time. So it's not just me. It's, it's, it's something of a separation between me and that emotion or that thought. Hi, uh, uh, this is Carmen. Um, I really liked your comment about how people that study are spend a lot of time in the past and in the future, like always remembering, you know, how bad it, it can be sometimes or, or anticipating, you know, going to stutter. Mm -hmm. um, I find many times that like if I'm having a particularly good day, I'm fluent, and then I start blocking, sometimes I don't even realize it. And the moment that I realize, oh my gosh, I'm blocking, I'm, you know, uh, this is happening, then I can use whichever technique I, I want to use to slow down or breathe and all that. But there are times that, you know, I, I don't even realize what's happening because I'm not focusing on this moment, on the present. I'm, th I'm, I'm all thinking about how do I get out of this or what's going to, you know, like this is going to get worse instead of thinking on the moment that, oh, geez, right, I, you know, I'm blocking. So this is what I know to do. So, right. right. Thank you for sharing that. You go right into the worry instead of just you know addressing what's happening in the present moment so that you can do something about it like you said start uh, using your techniques i'm going to need to go on i'm sure that there are other people who have questions and hopefully we'll have a little bit more time at the end for that but i am going to go on um, because i i want to continue we've talked about the observation i want to talk about the um meditation now okay and um what I'd like to do is have you experience some meditation before we talk about meditation, because there's no talking about meditation that beats experiencing it. So we're going to do a practice. And so what I'd like you to do is put your feet flat on the floor. Okay. Put your hands on your lap. Ideally, your elbows are right under your shoulders. You can close your eyes if you're comfortable doing that. And now I'd like to have you become aware of your breathing. Okay, notice the breath moving in and out of your nostrils. Notice your chest rising and falling. And now I'm going to ask you to modify your breathing just a little bit so that your breathing is even. And by that, I mean that your inhale and your exhale are the same length. And we do that by counting. So I'd like you to find a number of counts that you can use for your inhale and your exhale that allows you to breathe comfortably and smoothly. It could be three counts or four or five, whatever. It's going to be different for each of us, but find that rhythm. And then I'd like to ask you to add a mental image to that. I'd like you to think of a quality that you would like to experience more in your work life. It could be confidence, could be enthusiasm, could be connection. Those are just some ideas I had. Yours might be totally different. Use whatever comes up for you. Or if nothing comes up, you can use one of mine. And every time you inhale, feel 
that quality, entering your body with the breath, filling up every single part of your body down into your toes, your fingers, filling up your body. And every time you exhale, you let that quality settle into your body. So you're staying with that, you're breathing the even breath and you're breathing that quality in and you're letting it get absorbed into your system, into your body. Gonna stay with this a little bit longer. Just stay with that, the even breath, breathing in that quality, letting it settle in. All right, then you can uh, release that breath, return to your normal breathing. You can release that image, you can open your eyes. So that is an example. I mean, we didn't actually go away somewhere to like some kind of a retreat or a meditation room. We stayed right where we are, but we still kind of went away from our the situations that, that we are in, okay? We got quiet we got still and we redirected our awareness to something. And that's what meditation is. Okay, we talked about this a little earlier. Um, any kind of meditation like that is mindfulness. So we're just redirecting our awareness to something internal or external that we focus on. And here are some easy meditations that you can do at work. Okay, these are things that you can do at work for even just five minutes or even one minute. You'd be surprised at how things can shift by just spending one minute doing any of these things. You can think about and picture your feet in your shoes and then picture your shoes on the floor. Feel that connection, your feet to your shoes, your shoes to the floor. Do that for a minute. Breathe deeply and observe your breath. You can think about every single detail using all five of your senses of a location that makes you happy. Or you can look at an object that has positive association for you. Or you can do a walking meditation. You can walk and feel each step. You can notice the, your heel coming down onto the floor. Notice the ball of your foot coming onto the floor. Notice your heel rising off the floor just a very mindful walking and the experience of your feet. There are also guided med meditations through apps. And the one I really love is called Insight Timer. It's available on, I'm sure, iTunes. I'm an Android person, but I'm sure it's available on iTunes and on Google Play. I hear, I hear really good things about Headspace, so I know that that has them as well. And they do, they have meditations for like a minute or five minutes. Anything you need, they have it for you. So, and that's, you, you can just turn on your Bluetooth and you can do that right from your um, desk at work. So that is some information about meditation. And again, why does this matter? For people who stutter why should people who stutter meditate and the reason is one of the reasons is that our nervous systems really take a beating throughout the day don't they they really get knocked around and i mean if we go back to that um the old adage about the saber-toothed tiger and the amygdala hijack, which is a fancy way of saying that we get shocked and have a strong jolt of negative emotion or shock. Um, 
Like that prehistoric ancestor of ours who's running away from the saber-toothed tiger, assuming that he makes it, assuming that he outruns the tiger, it took him like several hours to recover from that experience, for his nervous system to become balanced again. So depending on the severity of the jolt to our nervous system, it takes some time to re recover. And I would bet that none of us have enough time in between these jolts and these bolts of negative um, experience to actually how our nervous systems recover. So when we have a chance, it really makes a difference to let our nervous systems really relax and reset, so to speak, and to heal our nervous systems because they really go through so much during the day. So, okay. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about, I'm going to get a little sciency on you um, just because I want you to understand that this isn't just like woo-woo Eastern religion stuff. Um, you can change your brain. Um, mindfulness literally changes the structure of our brains. It literally rewires our brains, okay? So researchers have found that the brain is not the permanent set organ that it was once thought to be, that there's something called neuroplasticity, which means that the neurons in our brain can actually change, okay? A neuron is a nerve cell in the brain, and they have connections with each other that are set through the different habitual thoughts and feelings and actions, behaviors that we do. And, and so you can see this maze right here. This is not an accurate depiction of what a neuron looks like, but it's a good metaphor for, so um, everything, every time you have a thought, feeling, or, or behavior, you strengthen that particular pathway. New thoughts and behaviors carve new pathways, okay? So the more these behaviors and thoughts are repeated, the stronger the pathways become. So there's this thick red line in this path through this maze, okay? And this one, this old pathway that we've gotten away from because it didn't serve us well and we have a more mindful way of operating now, it's kind of just sort of, sort of fade, fading away. So this is why this is important. It's actually changing our brains when we do this. And here is a more sort of accurate um, depiction of what neurons look like, okay? This, this connection between these neurons is very thick. That This is something that we've done over and over again a thousand times. These ones down here, they're a little bit more fledgling. They're new habits of ours. And the more we engage in those new habits, the stronger this one will become and the more this one will fade away. So I just, I just wanted you to know that there is science that backs this up, okay? And, and that there's a lot of research happening. In 2003, apparently there were 52 research papers published in scientific reviews about mindfulness. 2003, 52 studies, okay? In 2017, there were over a thousand. So this is becoming studied. This is interesting now to scientists and to researchers. And so there's more and more, um, more and more research being done that actually documents the benefits of mindfulness. Um, there, there are lots of studies. Um, I have a few I was gonna share with you, but I'll just share a couple um, in, 2015, a study with older adults that had sleep disorders. After learning to practice mindfulness, they had a significant improvement in their sleep. There's all kinds of studies like this. Um, and I'm going to move on because I want to just show you that these are some of the documented benefits of mindfulness, okay? Decreased stress, anxiety, and depression. Higher emotional regulation and cognitive control. That's one of the things I was talking about earlier when we're in it, when we're in that experience. How do we regulate ourselves and our thinking and our emotions? 
lower blood pressure, stronger immune system, improved sleep, all of these things um, that are really um, tangible, documented benefits of mindfulness. So I've talked a lot about mindfulness. I've tried to synthesize a lot of information and um, simplify it so that it's easy to take in. However, there are lots of resources that I can recommend to you. And so I just wanted to share a lot of these. The mindfulness-based stress reduction program is the sort of premier mindfulness program in the United States. It's done by the man I mentioned, John Kabat-Zinn. And it's a commitment. It's a long, it lasts for a few months and you meet regularly and it's it's a commitment of resources and of time but he also has two books um these two books right here that are very good good introductions to mindfulness and uh meditation the G greater good science center out of berkeley is a research-based organization that does a lot of research on uh, mindfulness and, and, and happiness. And they have a blog, they have a podcast, both of them are terrific. The podcast is somebody having done a mindfulness practice for some period of time and then coming back and reporting how it went and uh, what their experience was, they're terrific. Um, mindfulness actually has a magazine. Mindful Magazine talks about mindfulness from all kinds of angles. Um, it's a very good magazine. Um, Institute for Mindful Leadership. I will admit that I was not aware of this until I was doing research for, in preparing for this webinar. But that is really cool. And the woman who founded and runs that also has a book, this book right here, Finding the Space to Lead. And I know that I'm going to be reading that very soon. Um, but it seemed really cool. So I wanted to share it with you all. I mentioned Tara Brock. So I wanted to mention her, her organization, the Insight uh, Meditation Society. Of all the ones that I've talked about, this one is Buddhist. All of the other ones are very secular. This one is decidedly Buddhist, just a note about that. There's a conference in San Francisco, I think every year, Mindfulness Conference for Tech Leaders. I have a friend who's gone to it, apparently it's amazing. And then once again, these, um, these apps that I mentioned, Insight Timer and Headspace, I'm sure there are more. There's actually another one I used to know about that I just could not remember. So I'm, I'm sure that there are more, but these are, they have ones that are as long as an hour and as short as two minutes. So um, I really, I really recommend all of this stuff. Um, we just have a couple more minutes, um, but in those, in those couple minutes, um, I'm very happy to take any more questions or comments um, if there's anyone else um, who would like to share something or ask something. And Pam, if you wouldn't mind, let, let me know if there's anything in the chat that, that, is, um, that okay. is notable. I haven't really been able to keep up with it as I've been talking. Yeah, one person, wanted to know you mentioned that um um uh, that the practice of mindfulness is is a muscle that starts off weak and he wanted to know how do you know when that muscle has 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 strengthened well i think i think one way to know it is if we're trying to say i mean let's take again the example of that of the object that we looked at and if we are having um those invol involuntary distractions every 30 seconds and we're redirecting our mind and again the redirecting our mind the noticing that we've been distracted and then redirecting our mind that's also mindfulness 
that's us becoming aware of our experience. But, but if, we, if we are having that happen every 30 seconds when we start out, but then after a while we're noticing it only happens every three minutes, that kind of thing, it's, it's, just, it's just noticing how, um, if we can get those involuntary distractions to happen less frequently. That's, that's one very tangible way to know. So I have one more minute by, by my clock. So ha happy very to take helpful. any questions. Very helpful, very useful. Thank you so much. Oh, you're very welcome. It's been my pleasure. Mara, can I just uh, uh, do a closing uh, Thanks. remark? Sure. So I, of course, want to thank everybody for signing up and uh, attending live today. Um, I do want to um, um, remind you that we, the National Stuttering Association, who has sponsored this webinar, um, we have many, many, many resources for stuttering at work at um, westutter.org slash career success. That is where you will also find an archive of all of the webinars that we've done so far this year. And I want to encourage you to um, look for the final of, of the series um, next month in October, um, on October 22nd, which is International Stuttering Awareness Day. In fact, we're gonna be having a webinar on um, stuttering and employment law. And I do know from last month's webinar on self-advocacy at work, a lot of people um, express in, in, in interest in learning about that. So we will be offering that um, with an attorney that specializes in employment law and, and a, the co-facilitator will be a, per, a, per, a person who stutters. So please check that out. And Mara, thank you again. This was really wonderful. You're very welcome. I want to thank you for the opportunity and I want to thank everybody else for being here. Um, and and if you're if you're still here for just a few more seconds and you want to change to go gallery view, I love asking people to do this because it's it's uh, yet again another reminder that we're not alone. If we look at all these faces of all these people, um, you know we're all in it together. And if you want to unmute yourselves, um, we can just say goodbye to each other. Um, but again, it was a pleasure to be with you all here today. And thanks for coming. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Goodbye. <laughs> Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Very welcome. Thank you very much. <laughs>